to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel the of christ spreading the soul-saving message of and jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Psalm 1, verse number 1. Welcome to our study of the living messages of the book of Psalms. The Psalms are designed as songs of praise or adoration to bring honor and glory to God. And along the way, we find such practical messages throughout these books and throughout each chapter in the Psalms. In our second lesson on the Psalms, along with making practical application from the Psalms, we want to notice some Psalms about Christ specifically and then maybe give a little more background detail as well to the book of Psalms. The keys to the Psalms that we might mention are these. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the book of Psalms and in the Bible in general. In that chapter, which we'll notice a little later, the psalmist exalts the Word of God in Hebrew prose in a very beautiful way, showing its power, its adoration, and the beauty of God's Word. The shortest chapter, Psalm 117. And right in the middle of that, the key verse, Psalm 118, verse 8. And I want you to notice, this is not only right in between Psalm 117 and Psalm 119. But if you were to take all the verses of the Bible and divide them right in half, what would be the middle verse of the Bible? Listen to Psalm 118 verse 8. This is the middle verse of the Bible. The scripture says, It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in the man. Again, verses weren't there, and we understand that when they were inspired. But isn't it interesting? that the Bible says it's better to put trust in the Lord than confidence in man. Now, as we think about some more introductory material to the Psalms, as we mentioned, the Psalms were originally written, many by Solomon or David, as songs of praise. And, and some of these are even prayers showing love and adoration for God. Many of these were used in Hebrew worship during the days of the kings and so forth. The Psalms also cover many centuries of Israel's history. Some will take us all the way back to the flood, going through the wilderness wanderings at Sinai, even during the time of the captivity. You find Psalms that virtually cover almost every aspect of Israel's history. Then as we think about the Psalms, let's realize that David was one of the primary human scribes or authors of the Psalms, although there are others as well who contributed to this. But nonetheless, we recognize that the Holy Spirit, He is the one who authored the Bible, John 16, 13, 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17, and the words recorded herein are words of the Holy Spirit as praise and adoration to the Almighty. Almighty. Then as we think further about the Psalms, let's realize that these were originally divided into five books. Psalm 1 through 41 would be included in the first book. Chapters 42 through 72 would be included in that second book. Then in the third book, chapters 73 through 89. Fourth book, chapters 90 through 106. And then that fifth and final book or division would be Psalm 107 through Psalm 150. When we think about the Psalms, there's also a, a key word that you'll often see or a recurring term that you'll often see that if you're not familiar with, may be a little confusing. Maybe you've seen the word selah, that is S-E-L-A-H. What, do, what does that mean? Why is that in the Bible? I don't, I don't have a vocabulary for that per se. And thus, when you see that, what was that originally intended for? Well, the word selah is literally a term that was interjected right after a powerful thought, an encouraging verse, or, or something that the writer felt strongly about, interjected to cause the reader or the listener 
to stop and meditate on what was just said. And so anytime I see that, I want to I wanna stop and I want to think about, okay, what's so significant here? What's the lesson that's being drawn out? It, it, it's like that strong point that's being made directly before it. And so that's a key idea as well to the Psalms. Now, another thing that we want to mention about the Psalms is they have a very, very close connection to the New Testament. Let me illustrate it this way. Of the 283 citations from the Old Testament in the New, 116 are from the Psalms. Not quite half, but a lot of the quotes, especially Jesus will make many citations in His teaching and preaching that came directly from the Psalms. And so they're an integral part of what God planned and promised and what came to fruition in the New Testament. In fact, Psalm 110 verse 1, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool, is quoted some seven times in the New Testament, showing David's prophecy, the majesty of what's going on and all the great things that the New Testament had promised that are coming to fruition today. As we think about what we might say as the authority and power of the Psalms for today, let's realize this. Jesus Christ referred to the Psalms as laws. He quotes Psalm 82 verse 6, and then in John 10 34 he says, the law says, or does it not say in the law? And so when Jesus, not only were these words of praise or adoration, but Jesus recognized they were a part of God's law and thus binding on the people just as well as being intended for worship. Then we know this, that Christ Himself fulfilled all that was written in the Psalms about Himself. Luke chapter 24, verse 44, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms, Jesus said He fulfilled every bit of that. And so when I read about the Christ, when I read about the Messiah, when I read Matthew 27 or Matthew 26 or when I read about the resurrection in Acts chapter 2, I see the complete fulfillment of God's plan unfolded in Jesus Christ, prophesied centuries before it actually occurred. Now, let me just for a moment mention some of the Psalms that address and are referring to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In Psalm 2, we often refer to this as a, a coronation or a crowning psalm. Here, Jesus is ruling the nations with a rod of iron. That's quoted in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 as pertaining to Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords, reigning over the eternal and final kingdom, Revelation 11, 14 and 15, as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Revelation 19, verse number 16. And of course, Jesus is still King, reigning at the right hand of God. Then, of course, we have Psalm 16, a great resurrection psalm that Jesus would not be left in the grave, that His body would not suffer decay and destruction, but He arose out of that and is now reigning at the right hand of God. Again, mentioned in Acts 2, mentioned as we think about the resurrection of Jesus, and of course, our Lord and Savior fulfilling that in every detail. And oh, how could we forget Psalm 22, that great crucifixion psalm. His hands and His feet were pierced. The, the dogs were surrounded around Him. He became third, everything, just almost every detail that you see in Matthew 26 and 27 is mentioned in Psalm 22 and many references go right back to it. Now, here's something I want you to think about. If Psalm 22 prophesied in detail about the crucifixion of Jesus, say, a thousand years before, in minute detail. How did the psalmist know that? Well, he couldn't have known it based on speculation or best guess. The only way possible with that much detail 
his God told him. And thus, a powerful proof of the inspiration of Scripture and the fact that the God of the Bible is the author of Psalms and the whole Bible. Then we mention Psalm 72 and Psalm 110. Both of these are often referred to as kingly Psalms. Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool, showing the power of Jesus as the great King of kings and Lord of lords, and that He's reigning over the church today, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, and that God still rules in the kingdoms of men. Daniel chapter 4, verse 24 and 25, and mentioned again in Daniel chapter 5. And so it's the Lord's kingdom that will ultimately rule and reign. And then a final mention of Jesus in the Psalms, Psalm 110 verse 4, quoted multiple times in the book of Hebrews, says of Jesus, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Not only does this stress the, the priestly nature of Jesus, but His priestly nature is unending, unlike the Levitical priesthood, who had a certain beginning and ending age. Aren't you thankful Jesus is still priest? He is reigning at the right hand of God. He is uh, there to intercede and He made one sacrifice forever for sin. Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 12. And so the book of Psalms is full of, chock full of prophecies about Christ that remind us of what He did, of His glory, and of His ever reigning nature today. Now let's turn our attention for just a moment to some practical aspects of the book of Psalms and, and how those apply to us today. What we learn first as, as God's children is that in the book of Psalms I learn I don't have to fear if I'm a child of God. Now notice this with me. Look in Psalm chapter 3 and I want you to notice what the Bible says in verse number 6. That's Psalm 3, verse number 6. The psalmist says, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. The Lord is our strength and refuge. We will not fear. Psalm 46, verse number 1. Reminds me a lot of the words of Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6. The Bible says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. For the Lord Himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you so that you may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? We as God's people, this is one of the great benefits we have as a Christian. I don't have to fear. Here's the things you don't have to fear. You don't have to fear what the world's going to do to you. Not only is God going to take care of us on this side, now, I know there'll be difficulties. I know persecution may come, but I don't have to fear because this is not the end. This is just the small part of time. There's another part that we're longing for, that we're looking for, and were it the case that someone took my life, that wouldn't be the worst thing for a child of God. I don't have to fear. All is taken care of. All is well. Our names are registered in heaven's book, Revelation 3, verse 5. And if we live faithful unto death, we'll have the crown of life. Revelation 2, verse number 10. And so as Christians, fear should not encompass our lives and should not bring us to a state of terror. Then let's notice this. As God's people... We also learn from the book of Psalms that it is God who brings peace and safety to our lives. I want you to notice Psalm chapter 4, verse number 8. Look at the beautiful words of the psalmist here. Psalm chapter 4, verse number 8. The psalmist says, I will both lie down in peace and sleep for you alone, you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. When I think about God's peace that He brings into our life, the Bible says we can have the peace of God if we have the God of peace in our lives. Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 through 9. It's that peace that the angels sang about when Jesus came into the world. Peace on earth and goodwill toward men. Luke chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Friend, when we think about the peace of God, let's realize that's possible 
because of what Jesus did for each and every one of us. Now, to complement the idea of Psalm 4 verse 8, I want you to notice what Psalm 94 verse 17 also says. The scripture records, Unless the Lord had been my help, my soul would soon have settled in silence. I'd have had no, no one to cry to, no one to go to. In time of trouble, there'd have been nowhere to look. But it is the case that the Lord is our help. And thus, we don't remain silent. We speak out. We stand up. We approach the throne of God for help. Hebrews 4 verse 16. And as Christians, we're not the kind of people who cower in silence. Rather, we stand up and speak the truth in love. Ephesians chapter 4 verse number 15. Then another powerful lesson from the book of Psalms is this. It is our God who actually enables us to do the things that we do. I want you to notice Psalm chapter 18 and I want you to hear the words of the psalmist as he talks about God enabling him to be what he is and to do what he did. Listen to Psalm 18 verses 28 and 29. The Bible says, For you will light my lamp. The Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. For by you I can run against a troop. For by my God I can leap over a wall. Now, again, these are, are figures to show what he could do through God. But the good news is, God is still that light. He's still that lamp. He's still the source through which we can do great things. Isn't that what Paul was saying in Philippians 4 verse 13? Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. With God, nothing is impossible. Luke chapter 1 clearly teaches that idea. And so as a Christian, as a child of God, I've been enabled by God, by the blood of Jesus, by the promised blessings to stand up and be what I am and do what I do through the power of Christ. And if God is the source, if He's enabling us, then friend, our ability and power is only limited by what we limit it to be. With God, all things are indeed possible and Christians must realize the strength that they have. Then we want to notice this as well. From the Psalms, let's realize that in our lives, we've got to realize and let God be in complete control. Notice Psalm 29, verse number 10. Look at the control God has. The Scripture says, The Lord sat enthroned at the flood, and, notice this, the Lord sits as King forever. Along with Psalm 29, verse 10, listen to Psalm chapter 22, verse number 28. The Bible says, For the kingdom is the Lord's, and He rules over all the nations. God's not dead. He's still in control. He's still reigning from heaven itself. And just as God sat in power at that great cataclysmic event of the flood, so today God's still seated on the throne. He's still in complete control. Now, the problem is I've got to let Him have control over my life and you've got to let Him have control over your life. God's in control. Are we in control? Or are our lives out of control because we've really not put our trust and hope in the Almighty? Let's then learn another practical lesson from the Psalms, and it's simply this. Our God, He sees and He knows all things. Two passages that we want to mention. The first is found in Psalm chapter 33, and I want you to notice verses 10 through 12. The Scripture says, The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the people of no effect. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of His heart to all nations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people He has chosen as His own inheritance. Now combine that idea with Psalm 34, verses 15 and 16. The Bible says, The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth, in the nations and in our life. 
God's still alive. You know, I sometimes wonder, as I'm sure you do, when you hear about atrocities, when we hear about crimes against humanity, when we hear about ungodly things happening around the world, we wonder ourselves, why? And then I'm reminded, God he still rules in the nations. He's still alive. All is well. And although I may not can see the forest for the trees, I know that God sees all and His plan is in place. And because of His character, because of the way He has always dealt with mankind, I'm at ease by knowing God is going to take care of things. And not only that, but His eyes are open, His ears are open, He sees, He hears, and He knows when His Christians, His suffering ones, are in need. Another practical lesson that we learn from the book of Psalms is that our God does hear the prayer of His children. Listen to Psalm 55, verse number 22. That's Psalm 55. I want you to listen to the words of verse number 22. The Bible says, cast your burden on the Lord. He shall sustain you. Notice this. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. Here's the encouragement to when we've got burdens, when we've got anxieties, when we're struggling and, and we don't know how to deal with it. What do we do with it? We take it and we cast it to the Lord. You know, I, I know that the Holy Spirit inspired the Bible and how close are the words of 1 Peter 5, verse 7 for the New Testament today. The Bible says, Cast all your burdens or cares upon the Lord. He cares for you. What's the good news for Christians today? The line of communication for help is still available. Hebrews 4, verse 16 says, Therefore we must come boldly to the throne of grace that we might find grace and mercy to help in time of need. We can look up to heaven and say, Our Father who art in heaven. Matthew 6 verse 9. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man still overcomes much. James 5 verse 16. And Jesus said, Men ought to pray always and never lose heart. Luke 18 1. Pray without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse number 17. Then as we think about the book of Psalms, let's realize as children of God, there are wonderful benefits and blessings to being a child of the King. Listen to Psalm 68, and I want you to notice what verse 19 and 20 teaches us. The Bible says, Blessed be the Lord, notice this, who daily loads us with benefits, the God of our salvation. Our God is the God of salvation, and to God the Lord belongs the escape from death. Now, not only does He load us with benefits, not only do we escape from death, but listen to what Psalm 103 and verse number 2 says as well. The Bible says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. Not only are those benefits available, I have more than, usually more than I need every day, but I need never to forget those. We need to be thankful to the Lord. Colossians 3, 16 and 17. Give thanks in everything. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16 through 18. And thus, what a great privilege it is to be a child of God, a Christian, and to have the hope of eternal life. Now, we want to close on this idea. As we think about the Psalms, there's a, another beautiful message that we find in the Psalms, and it's this. Our God, He is always ready to forgive. You know, sometimes I think people have the wrong image of God. Don't misunderstand. God will punish ungodly people in eternal destruction. 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 7 through 10. There is a place called hell, and the ungodly will go there and be separated forever. Luke 16, 19 through 31. But friend, that's not what God wants. God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. And I want you to notice, watch what Psalm 86 and verse number 5 says. Take your Bible and let's look at this passage together. Psalm 86, notice verse number 5. The Scripture records, For you, O Lord, 
are good and ready to forgive and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. How, how, how does God view the sin problem? He hates sin and what it does to man. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 hates it so much that he, he gave the great remedy of his son. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9. And God stands ready to forgive. Now, are there things that a person must do to be forgiven? Sure. You must recognize that, that Jesus is the only way to salvation. Buddhism, Gandhi, uh, uh, Muhammad, all those, they can't forgive, but Jesus can. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Do you remember what Peter said in Acts chapter 4, verse number 12? nor is there salvation in any other. For there's no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. When we think about God, let's see Him as a God who really does want all men to be saved, who's gone the, the greatest length possible to make that salvation available for all mankind. Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20, God wants the gospel taken to all, and whoever so will, let him come and drink of the water of life. The Bible says in Revelation 22, verses 16 following. But friend, although God wants all men to be saved, and although He's ready to forgive, God's not going to forgive those who don't meet His requirements. There are things a person must do to be saved, to be forgiven of sin. You've got you've to listen to the message of this book, the Bible. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Romans 10, 17. Having heard that message, you've got to believe in Jesus. John 8, 24. Having recognized Him as the sole Savior and Son of God, you must Repent of sin. Acts 3 verse 19, Repent and turn again that your sins may be blotted out. Having repented, you've got to make that good confession and be immersed in water for the forgiveness of sins. Romans 10 verse 10, And as Peter said on the very first gospel sermon, Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins. And so what's the message of the book of Psalms? Praise be to God who deserves all honor and glory for the great salvation He's brought me and you. Friend, don't let that pass you by. Obey the gospel before it's too late. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the gospel through TV, radio, and internet. Our motto is to take the whole gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your walk. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form, or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll-free at 1-855-458-3905, or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 3730.